So I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. so kind of me rearrange the inverter, but I'm so grateful because my dear friends can slip away and all stay for open mic, of course, to cheer you all on. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem about the writing process. Uh, where I work, um, there was a woman coming to talk about the islands off India that are shrinking because of um, climate change. And she said that the meeting that they were having to raise awareness was going to be in scuba suits so that everybody would actually feel what it would feel like to be underwater. So I thought that was pretty cool. And at the end of the workshop, I thought, oh, I have a poem coming on. And I was driving. <laughs> I thought, I can't drive and write at the same time. And I couldn't find any paper. So I found a parking ticket, pulled over the side, and scribbled a poem on a parking ticket. So there's something about the poetic process in this, too. It's called, I Almost Didn't Write This Poem. I almost didn't write this poem scrabbling as I, was, as I was for a piece of paper or any scrap to write on before the name slipped into folds of brain like a sliver of soap in the bath. I almost didn't write this poem, but a yellow corner of parking ticket was enough to jot the name, Mariana, the last island off India that's shrinking as oceans slowly rise. A sorry woman said that they would hold a scuba summer there men and women in wetsuits underwater, so members would know the feel of silently submerging, groping for breath, vanishing. I get the bends just thinking about it. Watermarks on a map erasing the name of a country. I almost didn't write this poem because the ticket was too small for all the penciled words that spiraled into the margins. I wrote smaller and smaller till I almost gave up. I printed my name and address on the petition, wondering what words can do to save the lowest landmass on earth. But then a thought bubbled up. I almost didn't write this poem, whose last word is Mariana. Oh. Um, so this next poem poem's about Anne Frank. Um, there's a photo of Anne Frank where I work. And uh, underneath the photo is one of the sentences she, she says in the end of her diary. Um, and so that, those words, I think, have haunted me all my life. They're just so beautiful. So it's photographed for Anne Frank. The grainy sepia snapshot of your smiling face hangs, mounted on a plaque at the interfaith center where I work. Wisps of hair curl about your slim shoulders, your slender neck, and chiseled chin rise from a too big woolen overcoat. You gaze somewhere over my head. I cannot recall this picture's date and wonder, was it taken after Peter Van Pels tenderly brushed your cheek? After a night of murderous silence? After a hundred days of hiding in the stifling attic? There is no sign of tragedy in this likeness of you. Your eyes like clouds in two rims of light, shining portholes looking out to sky and sea. Larger than life size, this photo is projected often onto the shadowy scrim in my dreams. While the details of your visage are hard to recall, as I chase them like a chip of eggshell in slippery white, your words remain clear. Despite everything that has happened, I still believe people are really good at heart. <laughs> so this next one is from Nick for Nelson Mandela, whose funeral was celebrated all around the world this year. And um, there's a story, someone I know was at Robben Island and said that um, she met one of the prison guards who said, well, Nelson Mandela was in solitary confinement. There was no light, of course, but there, there must have been a small crack because at a certain time when the light would come through his solitary confinement, he would take a spoon and bang on the bars. And the prison guard said it became a ritual that was very powerful even for the guards, that everybody would come together in solidarity from their place of solitary confinement. So this refers to that drumming for Nelson Mandela. 
And it's written from the perspective of all the other people in solitary confinement who are also imprisoned for standing up against after time. In here there is sound. Keys clink against belt clasps. Spoons scrape on canteen trays. Rasps of iron grating half words, swearing, swazi, Afrikaans, and hacks of spittle splats on cement. Within that, a non-sound, so negative sounding, so zero, it hums electric in the inner ear after lights out, a ring in the brain like after a sonic blast, or that audible sting of having stood too close to a loudspeaker. Grief, a rusted hinge, opens wide throughout the night. Slam of metal gate, slam of metal gate, and after that, white noise. We can't imagine where you are, confined as we are in solitary, but at the appointed hour, as the sun sinks over the scorched dungeon, you merge with us, drumming with a spoon on iron bars. Beats quicken in every cage. This next one's from the perspective of a chickadee, because I just love chickadees. They just look like, you know what, little hermits in their black and white. So it's called I Am Chickadee. I am chickadee, repeat, oops, I am chickadee. I am repeating my end thrice in a self-sung song on a jack pine branch. My hermit's cat shines as I sing in solitude this morning. My black and white vestments holy with dewness. I crack open dawn. I split sunflower seeds to get to the soft heart and the sweet meat. Blinking my bead eyes at sunrise, I raise my hymn of praise. I know the secret encoded in this text of tree. These jack pine cones open only when split by fire. So I offer these small burnt candles to the morning, the ones with the prayers tucked inside. This next poem um, it is a little bit of a shout out to Ellen Jaffa because uh, I did a workshop with her and I had just um, found out about my breast cancer and she had this wonderful exercise to write from the perspective of something inanimate. And so I just thought, it was like a key clicking to open a lock. I thought, wow, I'm gonna write a poem from the perspective of the tumor. So this is called Tumor. I was hidden all those days, months, years, nestled in dense flesh. I, the ominous orb, curled myself larger in soft oyster folds. I stayed silent as a crab under the sea. Were you listening to what bubbled up? I was unknown to you, all those seasons of waves, starting out as a grain of sand, no more grit than salt at first. Swelling, I had no scent of green before rain. I had no shape or weight, just a mass of cells feeding like fish. By the time you saw me, bright as a penny in a puddle, or silver lure in an ocean mound, I shone out from the darkness, nested in breast. I wanted to be found. I chose to grow in your bosom, friend, for with it you nourished children and the world. Listen, crack open the oyster and pull out my pearl. Make space now to nourish yourself. Um, it was an amazing workshop. I feel like it really opened something up for me. So thank you. Um, I have two more. This one's a shout out for Tammy and Eldon and Leanne. We were all just in Wales. Um, like 48 hours ago, we were eating copious amounts of beautiful food and in the beautiful green and seeing castles. And um, each day we would explore one of the seven chakras. 
And so on the seventh day, um, we went to the, this beautiful place called the Bodnot Gardens where they had a laburnum arch, which is like yellow flowers hanging down in the light. It was beautiful. So um, I wrote this poem about the crown of chakra, but I will say that in yoga that morning, um, it came to me, you know, the Buddha's little middle path mm -hmm. is to keep your hands like this because the, the teaching is this is your power digit and you can do a lot of damage with yes. your power digit <laughs> if you're not careful. And this is your wisdom digit, so you are to balance your power with your wisdom. That's what this is all about. So there's a reference to that here, that's why I mentioned it. So it's called Crown. And it's hot off the press, so I'm sure it needs some fixing up at the workshop. I'll bring it to press. <laughs> Crown, how did we get here to this high place? Were our hearts not burning within us as we stood under the golden light of the laburnum arch? Seeing with our own eyes a million shades of green, we stand astonished, ruminating. That fairy tower I spied on the rocky first day seems not so far off now. Lady of the Lake. In fact, she is reflected in the lake of our eyes and has been all along. Let us point our power fingers away from judgment, curl our wisdom digit, strong thumb to make two circles joined with a touch like a lover's kiss, finger spectacles through which we can see anew, two flesh rings like a marriage of ourselves and forgiveness. And then this last one I tried to memorize, but I'm just going to have my, my little cheat notes there. It's called A Mouse's Prayer. Um, it's a winter poem because there's a bit of snow in it, but that's all right. Um, so, let's see if I can remember. A Mouse's Prayer. Oh, constant moon. You illuminate my tracks, almost imperceptible, across this thin blanket of ice-crusted snow. May you hide my scribblings and nibbles in shadowy corners and reveal for my shiny eyes pearls of hard corn, crumbs, and paper boxes of flakes I can gnaw holiness into. <laughs> Send a beam of light slantwise into the farm window. Drench the dresser drawers, raggy nest of tattered flannel, where my babes lie opaque in woolen scraps. My warm lima beans lie nestled together, dreaming six small parts into one big mouse dream <laughs> of nut butters and flecks of sharp cheddar. I will scurry my hair across the mantelpiece under the stone clock. My blessings on all cracks and cubby holes. My thanks for all things small and with seeds. My wish for protection from owl eyes and traps and things with lids. <laughs> oh, moon, you see me when others do not. You know my brown fur's sheen, and you reflect for me my own great smallness in your immensely dark and speckled sky. I did it, I think. <laughs>